I wanted to fly airplanes for the Navy, believe it or not. Um, and I, it was kind of a, a dream of mine from wh when, I was a, when I was a youngster. Um, I, I even knew I wanted to fly A-4s. I even knew what I wanted to fly. So I went into the flight program. Um, I had some difficulty with that because I had a, a problem with my eyes, a depth perception problem. Um, not as bad as I have now, obviously, but uh, I, I had read an article about the SEAL teams. And I said, that's what I really want to do. I, I would love to try to do that. Uh, thankfully, I was able to be uh, transferred from the flight program into uh, the Naval Special Warfare. On April 10, 1972, Lieutenant Thomas Norris was serving in Quang Tri Province, Vietnam. The 28-year-old Navy SEAL was leading a five-man rescue mission in search of two downed American pilots one of whom possessed critical strategic information that dared not fall into enemy hands. The two men had landed deep within treacherous enemy territory and were surrounded by 30,000 North Vietnamese troops. After repeated rescue attempts by air failed with major losses of helicopters and men, Norris and his elite team of SEALs were called in to undertake the perilous rescue on the ground. Our mission was to swim up the Mugang River and uh, contact one of the pilots, Mark Clark, which said he could get to the river and, and float down it. So we went to an area we could intercept him. And in that, doing that, we ran across just numerous enemy positions. We were w w working in and out of, of enemy units all night long until we got to the, and we finally found an area where we could watch for him. And at the time that he was coming down the river, which was probably about two in the morning, that he passed our location. And I could hear him coming. He was breathing hard. Um, you, I could hear him on the water. But we also had a North Vietnamese patrol that was coming right through the location we were sitting. At the same time, Clark is coming down the river. So I'm sitting there praying that Clark's breathing's not going to alert them and, uh, and that they will pass through us, which they did. Obviously, Clark had, flown, had floated past us as well. I went in the water to try and find him. Um, spent two hours looking for him because I couldn't, I, I, I figured I could swim faster than him, but I just couldn't see him. Early the next morning, I was in the water. I rounded a bend and, and I saw a figure you know, duck in the water uh, to try to hide. And I knew it was him, and so I just took off my hat and took off my, uh, put my gun behind me and just started talking to him and giving him information that he would be familiar with that the Vietnamese would have no way of knowing. And slowly trying to convince him that we were good guys and to come on out. So we got him back to our forward base, right away took him in and um, took care of him. I got my guys to uh, you know, clean up their gear and get ready to go for the next night. And at that time, we got hit by uh, mortars and rockets. We got hit heavily. As a matter of fact, it wiped out probably half of that uh, Vietnamese unit that was there. And those people, I mean, they just they started seeing their buddies get blown away, and they just froze. So um, it took probably about an hour and a half of that attack before we got it stopped. And I lost half of that group that quick, you know, within, during that attack. The next two days, we worked on trying to recover Hamilton. Um, were unsuccessful. I couldn't locate him. During this time, the Air Force was putting in other airstrikes. They put in 52 strike to try and reduce the amount of North Vietnamese there. Ford Air Controller called me and said, this guy's not making it. He's not making his, his calls on a time schedule he's supposed to. And when he does call, he can't talk. We dropped a survival paddle connection with him. He can't get to it. Um, he's just, he's losing it. He's, 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 he's giving up. He's not making it. I said, OK, we're going, to, going in after him that night. Ask one of the Vietnamese who was with me, a fellow by the name of Kit. I told him I was going after this guy. And uh, he said, you know, if you go, I'll go. And so I said, OK, but yeah, I can't. I'm not sure neither one of us are coming back. And I said, you know what's out there. We patrolled through enemy units till we got to a village, found a, a seaworthy sampan, got in that and started paddling upstream. We went by numerous enemy, enemy positions. We went through guys that were guard posts that were, fought, that were asleep. We just paddled right by them. 
I knew where I was. I knew what the Ford Air Controllers had told me where um, Hamilton was uh, for, in relation to where they dropped their survival pack. So I headed to that area, banked the sampan, got out, and started more searching for him. Located him relatively quickly. I was, I was very, very fortunate. I mean, I, 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 I parked right about where <laughs> he was sitting. I mean, that was luck. Um, of course, he realized I was an American. He starts to want to talk, and I kept trying to keep him quiet and put a couple uh, life vests on him, um, put him in a bomb sand pan, covered him with bamboo and vegetation, and hopped in the sand pan. Lieutenant Norris and Kiat made their way back toward the forward operating base, but soon found themselves under heavy enemy fire. Norris called in airstrikes, which allowed them to evade the enemy and reach their base. Both Lieutenant Clark and Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton were safely evacuated after what had been the longest, most intense rescue effort of the Vietnam War. After I was wounded on a mission six months later, um, I was back in the United States. The Navy SEAL teams uh, asked me to do a write-up on what happened so they could recommend it for Medal of Honor action. Um, I didn't agree with that. At the time, um, I didn't feel it was qualified for that type of a, of a mission. I said, listen, we're going to submit it. Whether you give us a thing or not, will you please give us a write-up? So I did. I don't feel that I was anybody special. I, I, I mean, I was, it was a time and a place uh, and a mission that needed to be accomplished, and I was fortunate to be the one that was successful in that. I would like to think that, that somebody else in my position would have attempted to do the same thing. I'm just a custodian of this medal. I wear it for those out there that, that deserved it and were never recognized, and the folks that uh, gave their lives for um, the missions they were sent on and will never be back again.